Hi, my name is Eric Singer, and I want to welcome you to All Access to Drumming. Now, the purpose of this video is not to tell you how to play drums, the right way or the wrong way. I believe there's no rules in how you approach drumming. The best thing, I think, is to find your own way and what works for you, because ultimately it's about getting results. Now, the, one of the main objectives of this video is to cover my equipment, what I use, why I use it, how it works for me. I'm going to go over some warming up and practicing techniques that I use to get prepared for a show or if I'm just practicing on my own. I'm going to cover some special areas like triplets, which I personally specially like, how to apply them in different odd note groupings. I'm going to go over some independence exercises and techniques as well as how I apply double bass and some really neat little exercises that may help those that are beginner double bass players to find ways to get them started in that area. Then I'm going to go over some performing ideas showing how I utilize live stick tricks, stick twirling, cymbal catches, some other little neat tricks that I like to incorporate. And then I'll cover some areas about how I approach live drumming versus recording drumming. And I got some really other neat stuff involved, some cool live footage. So hopefully, maybe you'll get something out of this where you can take and steal it from me and find a way to make it for yourself. And remember, there's no rules. So you find your way and make it work for you. Okay, now that I've introduced myself and we've gone over the basic objective of this video, let me show you my kit. Okay, what I've got here is quite a big, vast array of cymbals and drums. I use all Zildjian cymbals and drumsticks and all Pearl drums, hardware and pedals. Let me start first with the drums. What we've got here is a two rack tom, two floor tom, two bass drum setup. At this time I'm using Masters Custom Maple Shell four ply maple shell drums. I have a 12 by 8 inch deep, 13 by 9 inch deep, 14 by 14, and a 16 by 16. And right now I've been going back to using what I call traditional or jazz standard size toms. For the bass drums I have 22 by 16 inch bass drums and on the snare drum over here I've got a 6.5 by 14 8 ply maple snare drum which has as you will hear an amazing crack. Gotta love that crack. Now for the snare drum I usually will use a die cast hoop on the top because I tend to play a lot of rim shots so I want a real nice crack. On all the toms I use coated ambassadors on top, coated diplomats on the bottom, usually tuning the bottom head a little bit tighter, a little higher. Now the reason I do that is because I always liked big band or swing drummers as a kid growing up and I usually like a little more overtone which the overtone is created from the bottom head. So there again, I tune the bottom head just a little bit tighter. 
For the bass drums, I use Power Stroke 3 on the batter side, and as you can see, a coated white head on the front. I usually cut a small, about a six inch hole in the front to let a little of the air pressure out, but the bass drums are wide open. There's no dampening. On the batter side, I use a Remo Flam Slam Kevlar dot, partly to get a little impact out of it, and mainly so I don't go through the head. Now, I want to talk about the pedals. I use Pearl's new Power Shifter pedal, which is a brand new pedal they just came out with. I used to use another brand of pedal for a long time, but I finally have found a pedal that really suits my needs, and Pearl makes it. The great thing about this pedal is that it's really adjustable, aside from having a great feel and great action. It has a three-way adjustable footboard. You can adjust the angle of the beater for, for the torque and for the throw. You can adjust the spring tension over here. And another great thing is it has a beater that has four different sides to it, depending on the application you want. I tend to use the uh, hard or hard plastic side because I want a lot more impact because I tend to be a pretty hard, heifer, pretty hard hitter. Now let me talk about the hardware. I use all pearl hardware. I use a pearl legless hi-hat for double bass application, which is mounted with a double bass hoop mount and clamp assembly over here. And this works really nicely if you want to get your hi-hat pedal really in close to your left bass drum pedal. On top for a clutch, I use Pearl's new drop clutch. That's really great if you want to play double bass and you want to have a closed hi-hat sound if you only have one hi-hat. As you can see, I also use a closed X-hat over here, which is also a Pearl product. The thing that's great about having the two hi-hats is many times when I'm singing, I have a vocal mic that I don't use a headset. I use a vocal mic that comes in on a boom. And many times, I want to be able to have a good clearance, not only for my sticking, but also I tend to be able to sing better when my arms and chest is more open. So therefore, I'll have a closed set of hi-hats on my right-hand side. When I do back vocals or sing lead vocals, I'll play this hi-hat. For most of the time, I'll play the hi-hat over here. But also, I have the option of having two different sound sources. So let me talk about the cymbals now that we're on to hi-hats. As you can see, I have a really, really big, vast array of cymbals, all Zildjian. I tend to normally use a 19-inch crashes all around, which are custom rock Zs, with EFX 6 inches on top. And I also have a couple little small splashes around here in the front, 6-inch A, 8-inch K. For Chinas, I use 16-inch Oriental Trash. I always have one over my ride cymbal for a white noise kind of a reinforcement of the back beat for the snare drum. And then I tend to throw around a couple of other chinas at any given time, any given place. For a ride cymbal, I always like a 20 or 22 inch heavy type cymbal. It can be a Z, Earth Ride, and in this case, a K Custom Ride. I've been using the K Customs lately because they tend to have a nice kind of dry dry sound. For this application, it works really, really great. Many times in the studio, I'll also will add um, lighter weight cymbals, such as the A Customs and a smaller size, if I want something that speaks much quicker. But for rock application, I want cymbals that are very loud and very heavy and durable. Uh, especially in my hi-hats, um, I'll use, for example, a Z on the bottom, which is a very heavy cymbal, with an A rock bottom on top. And I do that on both sides. 14's on my left, 13's on my right. Now I want to talk about my seat and my seat height, which is something that's very important to me. Come on around and take a look at it. Now as you can see, I use a really big comfortable seat, which I feel is important because this is supporting your body and all your weight. The seat I use is Pearl's new. It's like a big motorcycle type looking seat. And as you can see, I sit very, very, very low. And usually what I use is a kind of like a measuring device for how high I want to sit in case I play somebody else's kit or a foreign drum set is my drumstick, which happens to be 16 inches long. And I usually will measure, as you can see, I have, it's roughly around 16 to 17 inches I sit off the ground. As you see, I sit very far away from the drum set and I sit on the very edge of the seat. And that's how I get my balance to play on my bass drum pedals. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about and I probably think the most important thing is my drumsticks. Because this is what we all use to hit these things. 
The kind of drumsticks I use are Zildjian drumsticks, which is my own model called the Eric Singer Artist Series drumstick. It's very similar to a 2B, except it's got a, a little bit bigger shank, a little bit bigger bead, and it's a wood tip stick. And uh, I'm really, really happy with these sticks. I've went through a lot of sticks through the years, and for me, these are like the perfect stick in the sense that it's a very big, solid stick, but has a nice balance to it. What I usually do live is uh, I'll have Zildjian put my logo and the KISS logo and their name on it, and then I'll take it and I file it off. And the reason I do this is because I get a better grip when I take a file and hack a lot of file marks about halfway up the stick. I tend to sweat a lot when I'm playing, and I find that when I'm sweating, rather than the stick slipping out of my hand, the porous grain of the wood tends to absorb into it when I sweat a lot. So that's what works for me. Plus, if I want to do stick spinning, I have better control. And there you go. That's my kit. All right. Now that you guys have seen my kit, you've checked it out, you know what I use and what I play, I think it's time to get down to business. Come here a second. Don't you agree it's maybe a little too bright in here? Think we should bring the lights down? All right, let's do that. All right, that's better. I like that. It's easier on my eyes. and Hopefully it's easy for you. All right, what I want to cover now is my basic like kind of warm-up routine. And this is what I do before I'm going to play either a live show or practice at home in my own drum room. Usually the first thing I want to do so I feel confident and secure and comfortable is go and check the kit out. So I usually will sit down behind my drums. I make sure that the seat height is right. I check my snare drum angle, tension of the heads on all the drums, ride cymbal, hi-hat cymbals, X-hat. Those are a lot of the main things that I play because that's usually what I'm keeping time on the hi-hat kick and snare or the ride cymbal or like I said before when I sing the X-hat. Make sure all my cymbals are the right tension and angles. Then I grab a pair of sticks, make sure they're filed the way I like, try to make sure they feel comfortable in my hands in case I want to spin them. Then the next thing I do, and probably one of the most important things, is I use earplugs. Now, I use ear protection for a reason, mainly two reasons. One, they save my ears, and two, they really do help me play in a real more relaxed way, and therefore, when I'm more relaxed, I feel like I'm much more powerful. I find in rock drumming, you're trying to achieve two things. You're trying to play as hard as you possibly can in the most relaxed way that you can. Now, those two things seem very contradictive, but it's really what's necessary, I find, to get the job done in the best way. With some economy of movement, economy of power, where you want to really like be able to slam it home. So what I do is I use these little, you kind of roll them up into a ball, and you kind of stuff them in your ears, like you're cleaning your ears out with Q-tips, but you leave them in there in this case. And I find that it takes a while to get used to, but if you try it, you might find that it really works for you. Uh, you generally have to tend to EQ your monitor system a little bit more brighter uh, so you'll hear things with a little better attack. But once you get used to it, you might find that it works great. The next thing I do is I try to find a really good set of headphones that can handle a lot of level. Because I, as you can see, I use a drum machine when I practice at times. And I want something that can handle a lot of low end because I program a kind of a bass drum sounding pattern in my drum machine and if I don't have something that handles a lot of end it will blow them up. Now the first thing I want to do is cover the basic paradiddle. Now we all know the paradiddle is the sticking of right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. I'll demonstrate it real quickly. There you go. Now I take the same paradiddle and I move that last double stroke, the right, left, right, right. Those double strokes, I move them around inside the paradiddle to the middle two strokes or the first two strokes. Now I'll play those three variations right now slowly first. There you go. Now what I'd like to do is start off playing any one of those paradiddles on their own, separately, or in combination together, I start by working them out slowly, try to play evenly in a relaxed, controlled way. Then I try to work them up 
to a gradually to a faster speed. Then I eventually start moving them around the drums to different sound sources. Then I also try to play them to a program pattern in my drum machine, which consists of a cowbell on quarter notes, and then bass drums playing 16th notes underneath. And I'll usually vary the drum machine speed anywhere from 90, 100 beats per minute, try to work my way up to 110, 120, 130, 140 beats per minute. You can start off with any tempo you like, vary it around because obviously it gives you the capability of playing these stickings at multitudes or combinations of tempos, which comes in handy because you never know what kind of groove that you might have to play a particular song at. So I'm going to do a demonstration of playing the three paradiddles on the snare drum only first. I'll start by playing them slowly, build them up to speed, then bring them back down or out to an open stroke again. Now the reason I do this is because when I was younger I used to enter these solo and ensemble drum contests and one of the requirements is that you had to know the rudiments and you had to be able to play those rudiments from an open to a closed back to an open sticking or strokes. In other words from slow to a fast speed and out. And I think it's a great way to practice not only this exercise but any drum fills or any drum beats because it teaches you to play not only at different tempos but then you also learn how to have control and a lot of times we're told to um, practice many exercises or beats and work them up to a fast speed everyone always says start off slowly and work them up to speed well I think it's also beneficial to work them in and out of those fast tempos therefore you learn to get a little bit of control so I'll start off by doing the three paradiddles, and I'll see you in a minute. Now, as I said before, I like to take that exercise either as the three together or on their own individually, any one of those paradiddles, work it around the kit, starting off slowly, build it up, try different sound sources, whether it's tom-toms, ride cymbal, closed hi-hats, crash cymbals, whatever you want. Not only is it a great exercise for coordination and independence because at any given time, Either of your limbs may be leading, but also you can come up with some really cool sounding stuff. And hopefully if you come up with something you really like, you can incorporate it into a drum fill or part of a drum beat. So I'll give you a little demonstration basically on playing the different combinations of the paradiddles. I'm not going to play them necessarily in order. I'll just play different variations of them around the kit. And we'll see what it sounds like. Something like that. Now, I usually will just play loosely and lightly around the kit, kind of just as a real loose format warming up thing. Then I like to take my drum machine, which has a pre-programmed sound source. Usually I'll use either a cowbell, or like I mentioned earlier, a cowbell with bass drum playing 16th notes underneath. And I'll start out, let's say for example, I'll start at 110 beats a minute. Let's just use that as a starting point. I'm going to play just regular paradiddles over the top on the snare drum at the same time outlining my feet with 16th notes. Alternate footing, right, left, right, left. But in my case, since I lead with my left foot, I'm weird, I lead with my left foot. I'll, I'll start that way.
you're still here. Another thing that I wanted to talk about, as you can see, I've been using a drum machine to run through some of my warm-up exercises. Now, I think a drum machine is a real important thing to use. And the reason I think it's great is because, one, it gives you a great tool to have something to control the time when you're practicing on your own. Also, two, if you ever want to do any recording in the studio with a producer or an artist that may want the time, like, dead on with the use of a click track, by practicing with a drum machine, it helps hone your skills in that area. And it's also a fun tool to use because you can solo over it, practice just playing time, program beats into it, whatever suits your fancy. You know, use your imagination. If you don't have a drum machine, you always got the old trusty tape player, CDs, and if nothing else, you got a radio. And the thing that's cool about the radio, anytime you want to play a different type of groove or beat or feel, you just change the channel. And also, there's another advantage that a lot of rap music or hip hop type beats are done with a drum machine. Therefore, the time is like dead on constant. You can either play the exact groove or beat the way you hear it on the radio, play straight time over it, or you can practice soloing over it. You know, whatever suits your fancy. Now, something I think is also real important, when you're going to work with a drum machine, a lot of times you have to find a way to play comfortably with it. And you'll find that sometimes if you play too dead on it, it can sound a little stiff or sterile. So I try to like snake, as they call it, in and out of the beat. So it's not dead perfect. It almost has like a little bit more of a kind of human feel, you know, a little bit more like the human pulse. And uh, I found that sometimes a particular song, you may have to play a little more on top of the beat or a little more behind the beat, depending on the groove and the feel. And uh, the way I do that is I usually try to compensate physically with my body on how I'm going to feel or interpret a groove, whether it's on top or behind the beat. Now, if I want to play on top of the beat, I actually physically tend to get a little closer to my kit, kind of leaning more on the hi-hat, something like this. Now, if I want to play the same kind of beat, but play a little bit more lazy feel, even though it may be the same, te same tempo, what I try to do is create a longer or greater distance between the drum strokes that I'm playing with my hands, therefore creating like a millisecond delay, which is usually just enough to move the time back. So some, it actually makes it sound a little bit fatter and heavier. I find that that gives it just the right amount of space to create a difference between, say, playing a little ahead or a little behind. And there you go. Which one are you at? Oh, okay, I guess we'll start here. Okay, the one thing I want to talk about that I really think is cool, I really dig, is triplets. Now, the reason I dig triplets is because I think you can do a lot of cool things with them. Now, I was just doing some basic triplets there opening up, the typical. Now, that's a standard triplet that a lot of people use and a lot of people can probably actually play. But I like to take those basic triplets and find ways of playing that triplet feel with more than just three notes at a time or three note groupings. I like to use two note groupings, three note groupings, four note grouping, five, six, whatever combination you can come up with. And I like to mix them up. And by doing that, not only do I come up with some cool licks, I come up with some really odd combinations and stickings around the drum kit that I can incorporate into fills or to beats. And I found by working on this on a regular basis, I've come up with a lot of really cool things that I've used through the years in my playing. The reason I like to incorporate triplets also is because a lot of the original early drummers such as John Bonham, Ian Pace, uh, Bill Ward, those 60s and 70s drummers, Mitch Mitchell, they played a lot of things with a kind of a real round or like circular type feel. And you can almost literally play triplets like 
play like a triplet feel continually under their beats, like. Now, if you took that basic beat that I just played and played triplets, like. You could probably have that continually going underneath it the whole time. And you'd really, really learn to appreciate the triplet feel. Now, what maybe I'll try doing that, I'll put on my drum machine that has a triplet feel programmed into it. Let's see how it sounds with me playing that kind of a beat over the top, and maybe you'll get a better sense of what I'm talking about. There you get the basic idea. Now what I want to do is I want to take the time to show you some basic triplets around the kit. Now we all know the typical one where you play Now those are basic three note triplets, in other words three different sound sources, three different limbs, or three note groupings. Now, sometimes I'll also play them where I'll play a two note grouping, which would be like. Now, obviously, when you hear some of those stickings on their own, they might not sound like a triplet. But when you hear them in context with the drum machine, which has a triplet feel programmed into it, you'll see how the sticking lays against the triplets, and then you'll probably hear the triplet feel. There you get a basic idea of two notes. I'm holding three. Is that three? Two. Now, what I'll also do is single note or single strokes on each sound or drum in a triplet feel, like this. Now, if you heard some of those fills on their own, like I said earlier, they'd probably sound kind of foreign. But now, if you try to play some of those fills in the context of a beat, you'll see what I mean. There you saw I incorporated one note and two note groupings of triplets. Now obviously you can take those triplets and go up to an infinite number of stickings or groupings. Threes, fours, fives, six, sevens, whatever you're capable of. Obviously it depends on the application and how far you want to take it. Now I'm going to give you some other examples of playing the groupings in four, five, and six, and seven note groupings for the time being. What I'll do is I'll first show you the grouping on its own. Then I'll show you in context with a drum machine, then incorporated with a drum machine and a groove, so it makes a little more sense. Now, a four note grouping would be something like this. Now, as you know, a triplet is three notes. If I play four notes, we have three notes of the triplet and one left over. But if I play three groupings of four, we have a total of 12 notes. Now, if you mathematically subdivide that, that's the same as playing four groups of three. So what I'll do is I'm going to play with the drum machine again just the four note grouping fill against the triplet feel so you can see what it sounds like. Now there was just between four sound sources. Obviously you can Mix it up regarding, in regards to how you want to place your sticks around the drum kit. For example, Now there 
was basically four note groupings, sometimes between four sound sources, sometimes between only three or two. Now, if I incorporate it with the groove, it'll make a little more sense. Okay, that was four notes. Now let's try going to five. Four or five? Five. Now with five, it starts getting a little tricky because five is an odd number. Especially when you're talking about triplets. Now triplet three is an odd number as well. Five gets a little more twisted, but it's not really as hard as it may seem at first. There again, using a drum machine is a great source because you have something that you can lock it into. Then you practice playing the grooves and placing these groupings in there. It'll really help you a lot. Now, a five note groupie would be something like this. Now, obviously on its own, it sounds kind of foreign. Now let's hear it with a triplet feel. Okay, there you heard it against the triplet feel. Now let's hear it with like the beat. Now obviously, I'm going to take it up to six, which would be something like this. play between those drums, I can play between hands and feet. Two bass drums or this kind of stroke. You know, any type of strokes that you want to designate for your limbs is really up to you. The whole idea is to play a six note grouping at one time. Same thing when you get into sevens. A seven is gets a little tricky. It would be something like this. Now obviously, like there again, on its own, it sounds foreign. In context with the drum machine, Now obviously, seven sounds kind of weird, but you can probably find a place to use it once you feel comfortable with it and the flow of that triplet feel remains constant throughout it. Now the best way to do it is obviously if you have a metronome or a drum machine, you can start by playing any uh, combinations of groupings on their own individually, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, six note stickings, and then start incorporating combinations of all of them together. Now I'll try that, just playing the different groupings by themselves, then I'll go into a group and play some of the fills mixing them up. There I was just showing you all different groupings between ones, twos, three, four, five, six, sevens. Now, if I want to incorporate it as a beat, then it gets a little twisted.
Now that's my take on triplets. Obviously you can take it in your own direction. That's the whole idea of this. Get some ideas from me, steal them, put them in your pocket, walk out the door and go do it for yourself. Oh, and don't forget, it doesn't matter whether you play single base or double base. The exercise applies to both types of players. So go try it out. Hey, we're back again. Now what I want to do is take a little time to talk about some independence and some double base application and some exercises. Now with your video you should have gotten like a little worksheet looks something like this. And basically it's some written figures, 20 bars. You can use them in any combinations you like, reading the page right across, something like this, up and down, backwards to get more variety and more mileage out of this worksheet. You can also pick up some other books such as Ted Reed's Syncopation or Stick Control, some of those other books that have similar type figures in there that you can use if you want to get more extensive with some of these exercises. Now what I like to do is take these figures and play different ostinato or cymbal hi-hat type patterns with my right hand and play the figures underneath with either my foot, my left hand, or the combination of both. Sometimes play double bass patterns underneath and play the figures over the top on just the snare drum or between different sound sources such as right ride cymbal, left hand on the snare. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to start off real simple at first with a basic rock ostinato, basically playing quarter notes with my right hand and I'll play the figures with my foot first, then I'm going to play the figures with my left hand, then I'm I'm going to combine them and play it with both. I'll do it slowly, then I'll try playing them a little more up-tempo. And I'm going to move my way around the kit and show you more examples, get a little more extensive, show a little swing time ostinato, a double bass shuffle, and then some double bass stuff. And then we'll get further more involved with double bass. I'll give you some examples of how I've taken some of these ostinatos and some of these work patterns and developed not only just some drum beats, but also drum fills and passages that I've used in songs and actually have incorporated. Okay, the first example I want to show you is a basic rock ostinato. I'm basically going to basically going to play quarter notes with my right hand and I'm going to play the figures with my right foot only. I have a drum machine that I have set up over here for 120 beats a minute. I'm going to play along to that. If you don't have a drum machine, then try starting very slowly before you try to build up the speed. Remember, try to stay even and very controlled and solid. All right, there you go. That was a very simple one. Now I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time I'm going to play just my left hand, playing the same quarter notes on the right hand. After I do that, I'm going to combine the two. Then I'll try playing it at a little faster tempo, and we'll see how it sounds.
Okay, the next example I want to show is basically what we would call like a swing time thing, something like this. I'm going to take that ostinato and there again play just the figures with my foot, then my left hand, then combine the two. All right, there you go. That was the basic swing time, right foot. Now here's the same thing with my left hand. All right, there you go, left hand. Now I'm going to play the combination of the two, then I'll try playing it a little more bumped up so you can get a better idea of how it might sound at a higher tempo. There you go, there's a little example of playing alternate right foot, left hand. Now I'm going to try playing it a little more up tempo without the click, just so you can get a little idea of what it might sound like. There you go. Now I'm going to try the next thing, playing a similar type swing feel, but this time I'm going to play a shuffle or double bass shuffle underneath with my feet, playing the ostinato, swing time right hand, the written figures with my left hand on the snare drum. There you go, that was a basic double bass shuffle, playing kind of a swing time thing over the top. Obviously you can get this thing up to, you can get a cooking speed, something like this. And you can eventually go anywhere you want with it, but there's a good starting point.
Okay, the next example that I want to show you is playing these written figures there again, this time playing either eighth note or sixteenth notes with your feet underneath, playing the basic figures over the top, and you're going to use alternate sticking with your hands. After we develop that, we're going to move on to moving the sticks or limbs around the kid a little bit, maybe developing maybe a kind of a groove between the right hand on the ride cymbal, left hand on the snare, or between the different toms. But I'm going to start first with just snare drum phrasing over the feet. Okay, as you can see, I was just playing the basic figures as they're written over my hands. You could start reading the page with your left hand first or your right hand first, whichever one feels more comfortable, but if you try it both ways, you'll find that you get a little bit different feeling combinations within your limbs and it'll help develop a little more independence. The last exercise I want to show you about double bass is in answer to a question I get from a lot of people, and that is, how can I develop or start to play double bass if I've never played it before. Now, aside from using some of these exercises and playing the figures over the top of straight eighth or sixteenth notes, that is a great way to start as well. You can start real slow and build it up. But another way that I found that really works cool is where I incorporate... What are you doing over there? Come on over here a second. Yeah, work your way around so I can talk about my hi-hat and what I'm going to do over here. That's great. Okay, come on in a little closer. We're going to be over in this area. Great. What I want to talk about is using the hi-hat as a pulse or timekeeper. Now many of us, when we're playing a basic beat such as this, now many times we'll keep our hi-hat always keeping time or the pulse continually throughout the groove even through our fills so I found if I incorporate that philosophy of keeping time with my left foot on the hi-hat and I just move it to a different sound source meaning my left bass drum and I play the same beats and grooves that I already know how to play I come up with some really 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 cool combinations that almost sound like double bass patterns and if I told you to try playing some of these patterns on your own, it might sound confusing. But if you break it down and play the beats that you already do know how to play and just move the left foot to a different sound source, you'll find you come up with some really, really interesting combinations. I'll give you a quick example. I'm going to take the same pattern that we played before or something similar. I'm going to start by playing on my hi-hat. Then you're going to see me move my foot over to the left bass drum. So you hear the difference, then I'll move it back. I'll go between the two so you can hear how it adds like a double bass pattern. All right, you get the basic idea, right? Now, the idea with this is you can start off with any grooves, any beats that you already know how to play. The whole idea is to find a different way to play them just through sound application. Now, what you can do is after you get comfortable with playing some of these beats at a slower tempo, try bumping them up quite a bit and see what you come up with, and you'll, you'll get some great, great sounding licks. Check it out.
Now, as you can see, I was breaking it up with different beats, but I was just taking basic drum grooves that I already know how to play and adding that left foot. And then you see the possibilities are endless. So try it out for yourself. I'm sure you'll come up with some great stuff. All right, now that I've showed you some examples to apply to these written figures, I want to show you some examples of how I've taken the way I practice to these and applied them in real application to songs and drum fills. All right, the first example I want to show you is how I incorporated playing some little broken figures over the top of double bass in the solo section of the song Unholy. I did something similar in the beginning of the song Creatures of the Night when we would perform it live and this went something like this. There again, broken phrasing over the top of the feet. Now there was also a song that I used a really cool kind of sounding lick in a song called Hard Driver when I played with the group Badlands. And that was basically a broken pattern through the toms in the intro of the song. And then I went to a basic pattern between my toms and the snare as the backbeat once it got into the body of the song. It started something like this. Now, the last example that I want to show you is going to be from a Black Sabbath song. The intro of the song was called Turn to Stone. It was basically just a double bass pattern between the ride symbol and the left hand over the top, kind of similar to the broken patterns that I played earlier in one of my exercises. Okay, now that I've showed you some examples of how I try to apply my double bass either in groove format with beats or for licks in fills and songs, hopefully you'll get some cool usage out of this stuff. My whole approach to double bass has always been to find a way to utilize it in a musical way, not just to play straight hammering eighths, but also a way to incorporate some cool fills and licks as well. I want to also mention that if you don't have a double bass setup, Let's say, for example, you go to jam with some friends, or you go to play on a track in the studio. You don't have double bass. You don't have a double pedal. But you still want to be able to incorporate some of those licks and fills that you might use with two feet. I always try to work on playing some of those same sounding licks with one foot. For example, the typical rough, which is three strokes with the feet, one with the hand, like this. If I don't have double bass, obviously, I can find a way to make it sound similar to that by using the other drums, something like this. Now you get the basic idea. Obviously, you can move your hands around the drums and try different limbs to incorporate similar sounding licks between the kit, like this. Now the whole idea is to try to get as much mileage as you can out of licks that you already know how to play. Remember, just try applying them to different sound sources between different limbs. All right, one of the most important aspects about my playing that I want to touch on is performing. And that includes live performing as well as studio performing. And what I want to talk about is how I listen to the band. When I'm in the studio, I might be playing to a click track. So I may want to have the click real loud, maybe emphasize one of the instruments more so than the other. But when I play live, I try to do what I call peripheral listening, where I'm listening to the whole band and everybody around me at the same time. I may focus or key on the rhythm guitar more so, or maybe the bass on a particular song, depending on what seems to hold me down to the groove and the time better. But I always have to pay attention to everybody 
and everything that's going around at all times. Even if I have my head down like this and I'm hammering away at my kit, I'm always trying to be aware of the location where everybody is. Because at any given time, somebody may play something a little different and I have to either support them and back them up or maybe embellish them with some different kinds of licks in case they go off on a tangent to jam or something. So I find by listening and being aware of your surroundings at all times is a real important key to performing live. The next area I want to talk about is how to play in a more musical way, incorporating some chops or technical aspect of drumming as well as feel. Now we all know that feel is the most important thing for a drummer to do as well as keeping good time. And we have to also remember the responsibility of good time is not only on the drummer. I found when I play with other musicians that have a real good sense of time, I tend to play with a better sense of time. So the responsibility, even though we are a timekeeper in the band, the responsibility is also on everybody else as well. And you'll find when you play with better musicians, you'll tend to be a better musician. Now the way I like to incorporate chops and feel is I try to be inventive with some cool licks and cool beats within the context of a song without sacrificing the feel. I realize my main job is to keep good time and to create a good feel with a solid backbone for the musicians that I'm supporting. So what I want to do is show you some examples that I've incorporated in some songs, some different grooves or beats that I feel were kind of somewhat a little tricky and inventive, but they were based around the riff or phrasing of the song. First example I want to show you was from a song called Devil Stomp from the group Badlands. Now I tried to take basically one of my major influences, which was a John Bonham or Led Zeppelin-esque type of beat or groove that was based around the guitar riff, and it's almost like I'm outlining the phrasing of the guitar. It goes something like this. Okay, that was Devil Stomp. As you can see, it had a very syncopated up and down and around, kind of almost like a tongue twisting type drum beat, and it's based around the guitar part. But you'll see that it still maintains a certain kind of a groove or beat thing, kind of a circular motion. The next song that I want to show you an example from is off at a yet to be released Kiss song called Hate. And basically, I heard the riff, and I wanted to come up with something that I thought kind of was based around the guitar riff, but had a little bit of movement between the drums. Go something like this. They're ringing everywhere. The next examples that I'd like to show you is incorporating some different type of fills that I call ascending drum fills. In other words, going backwards through the kit, starting with my floor toms. Now, a lot of times it's a very simple thing to do, but we don't always necessarily think about utilizing it. And the way I got this idea was years ago I was really into Queen, and I heard a song called You're My Best Friend, where Roger Taylor would always do this backwards or ascending drum fill in numerous times throughout the song. So I've taken that kind of approach, and I utilized it a couple of times in a song called Heart of Chrome, at the, in the intro, and also in a song called Tough Love, I did a kind of a triplet fill going through the drums, descending, and backwards ascending. I'm going to show you both examples. Now that was from Tough Love. It's a basic drum fill that I used in one passage of the song. As you can see, I used triplets, descending, then I ascended back, just turned it around and came right back up to the snare. Actually, it's a very simple lick to work out, but it ends up sounding pretty cool if you find the right place to use it. Now, the next lick was from a song called Heart of Chrome, where there again, using just 16th notes, I played backwards, starting with my floor toms, ascending up through the drums, and then I went descending the other way, something like this. So that was a couple of examples of, to show you some 
simple licks that with some creativity might sound a little more technical than they actually are. It's just the creativity and imagination that you use in your head and transfer down to your sticks. Another important aspect of my plane that I want to talk about is live plane versus the studio plane in regards to how I apply my drum parts to the songs. I like to take a studio version that may be a little bit more straighter or simple and try to what I call like hot rod it up. It's like taking a car and putting a bigger carburetor and better exhaust system and bigger tires so it'll go faster and do more, get more performance out of it. But mainly it's from the point of view that I want to be a little more entertaining and exciting for the fans. When I was a kid growing up, I really liked when I would go to a concert and see the band take the songs to another level. Now the examples that I want to use would be a song called Detroit Rock City. The original studio version had a drum beat that went something like this. Now what I did is I took that basic beat, which is kind of like a swing shuffly type of groove, and I played it with my feet double bass stuff like this. Basically, I kind of updated it. I took the original kind of basic groove and put my kind of Eric Singer stamp on it, if you will. Now, the next song that I want to show you that I adapted for, to a live interpretation is Love Gun. We all know the basic beat to Love Gun, which is something like this. That's the opening, very familiar. What I did was outline that same riff on the snare drum with my feet, like this. There again, simple part, simple application, but I thought it kind of beefed it up, and there again, it's a way of adding a little of my own personality without taking away from the essence of the song. Now, another song that I really liked the hot rod up a lot was a song called Parasite. And a lot of people would always comment, hey, I really like the way you spiced up Parasite live. So I want you to check out this footage. This song's called Parasite! Let me see your
Another area that I want to cover is what I would call visuals or maybe you want to call it stick tricks. I was really influenced by visual type drummers my whole career and I have always felt like that I wanted to learn how to incorporate some of that into my playing. So I would always work on like, you know, stick spinning, you know, it's mainly on breaks. I don't use, utilize it so much in the context of playing grooves. I usually use it when there's a break in a song. I may hold my hands above my head and do this type of spinning. Sometimes just one hand spinning like that. And sometimes both. Another trick that I like to use is when I'm playing a groove or time, maybe do what I call like stick bounces either off the hi-hat or the ride, something like this. You get the basic idea. Another thing I incorporate a lot is cymbal catches or playing my cymbals what I would call backwards or underneath. And I got that from watching guys like Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, a lot of big band drummers. Uh, years ago during the swing era, the drummer was a very featured part of the band. And the more charismatic and visual the drummer was, the more exciting it made the band seem. Rock and roll kind of changed that where it took the guitar player and the vocalist as more your focus and front figures of the band. But I took a little of some of the tricks that I liked from guys like Buddy Rich and those other guys and tried to incorporate it into the rock and roll thing. Simple catches, something like this. They keep always ringing. It's like a telephone. Another one that I like to use is playing my cymbals backwards. Something where I strike the cymbal like this. Sometimes individually within a groove, or sometimes I'll do what I call a windmill, something like this. Anyways, you get the idea, and if nothing else, it helps keep me cool. Now, another aspect that I like to use is something that's what I call like almost like half stick twirls or half spins over my double bass plane over my feet, something like this. Right, the last visual that I want to show you is something kind of like a crossing over pattern and I kind of mix it up in different directions. Check it out. Right, the last thing that I want to talk about to wrap things up is some of the business side of the music business. I think that's one area that sometimes is neglected and unfortunately it can really hurt you in the long run. You know, unfor we, you know, we all want to go out there and just bash away as much as we can. That's what we're into it for, to just concentrate on playing these, the drums. But ultimately, you'll find that as you get more involved in the business, it becomes more business than it does music and it's gotten more and more that way through the years. So it's real important to make sure you watch out for your best interests and protect yourself. That's why it's a good idea to have a lawyer to represent you in case you ever have to deal with contracts where your name is gonna be signed on pieces of paper that makes you liable for debts, which means you could owe money to somebody. So you wanna make sure that you're always protected and your interests are protected. Whether you choose to have a manager or an agent, I think that's a personal choice depending on what level you get to. Obviously, if a band gets a relative amount of success, you're going to need somebody to represent you, to help you go out there and do some negotiating, to help you get on tours, 
you know, to pull some of the political strings that are needed to help a band, you know, rise to the top. Another aspect I think is really important is always remain professional at all times. I think that's really, really important. You know, we all have good days, we all have bad days. But if you're going to be frustrated or put your anger out on anyone, take it out on your drums. You got to remember, you're working with other people. There's a chemistry involved, and people have to want to work with you and enjoy working with you. You make it easier on them and yourself when you're always professional. That means being on time, being prepared at all times. And in being prepared, I mean, if you go in for an audition, know the material. Because I've known, I've found when I've gone into auditions and wasn't prepared, I didn't get the gig. But when I took the time to learn the material and be prepared, I had a lot more confidence. And confidence is one of the keys to going in and representing yourself the best way you can. I mean, to show people how you can really play these drums, you got to make sure you're prepared. Then, once you get to that point, you've sold them on your playing, then you got to sell them on you, your personality. You don't have to try to put on an act. Be yourself. Because if they don't find out what you're about that day, they're going to find out eventually. So just be real. That's what it's about. And remember, be cool and nice to everybody. Because you never know who may recommend you or drop your name for a potential gig. It could be a guy as a second engineer in the studio. It could be a guy sweeping floors at a rehearsal hall. It could be a roadie, a tech, a sound man, anybody that you run in contact with. Somebody may have seen you at a show and said, hey, I saw this guy. I really liked the way he played. I met him afterward. Seemed like he had a great attitude. You should check him out. I think he'd be good for your situation. It happens like that. It's happened to me and it's happened to a lot of my friends. Another thing I want to talk about is staying in shape, taking care of yourself. You know, remember what you put in your body, it's going to re be reflected in how you look and how you're able to perform. You know, I'm not going to try to preach about diets or anything. I try to eat low fat, non fat food, eat healthy food, go to the gym and exercise, practice it as often as I can and as much as I can. I find by doing that, I feel better, I'm more consistent, and therefore, not only do I benefit from my plane, anyone that I'm working with, benefits as well. And the last thing I want to talk about is drugs. Drugs are a losing proposition. I'm not here to preach to somebody how they should live their life, but I've seen it around me too many times. A lot of great talented people that really have gone by the wayside because of drugs. So just remember, take care of yourself. Try to live clean. Try to have a healthy, positive attitude, and you'll probably have a good chance of going far.